Good evening, Living Faith Fellowship. I'm so glad that you chose to join in with us tonight to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And uh, we are just um, excited to be able to gather together, even around a computer screen, uh, and reflect on this Good Friday and all that Jesus has done for us. And so I'm going to just open us up in a word of prayer. And then we're going to have a video a video that is a kind of a dramatic presentation of, uh, but yet in a lighthearted way, because uh, it's done by the skit guys. And if you've ever seen the skit guys, they have their way, but yet they can penetrate to the heart. And so we're going to have a video that will just kind of take a look at different characters or people that were in that, in that passion week and, and hear things from their perspective. And it'll kind of set us up and prepare us for, what what is happening and where we are at this point in the Passion Week before we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to uh, uh, just go ahead and show you that video, and then we'll come back with more. It, it was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. Um, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me, and he whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus doing with the foot water? You know, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. <laughs> you know who broke the silence. Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was uh, a new covenant with his blood. And he said, um, tonight, all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there, I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you, you can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, Peter, you'll deny me three times for tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, um, it's, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with them and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, <laughs> And I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. 
The one that I kiss on the cheek. That's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter, <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus, Jesus reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. It didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotting in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering, you name it, I've done it. And I knew, the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, I mean, that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and, and, they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, one minute, I, I am a man marked for death. And then the next, I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. 
Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath, and he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely, this man was the son of God. Well, that was a very thought-provoking video. I love the way drama can help us enter into the story. And I feel like that's what we just did, was we entered into the story of the, those days before the crucifixion and during the crucifixion and what characters were thinking and feeling and it opens our minds and so <clears throat> I really appreciate that and uh, before I say a few words about the Lord's Supper that we're going to share here in a little bit um, I want to just let you know something that we're doing as a church that we thought was kind of fun thing in the front of the church um, from now until probably Monday you can you can drive by and tune your radio to 87.9 and you will get a message of encouragement, a message of hope. And, and uh, really, it's going to be the gospel. And so I'd encourage you to drive by, listen to it, but also tell your friends about it um, to go by and just listen because it's going to be uh, an opportunity for them to hear the gospel. And so I thought this would be kind of a nice thing to do. There's so many things in the news that are worrisome, discouraging, make people fearful. This would be something they can go and listen to a message of hope, which is the gospel of Christ. And so encourage you to take part in that and encourage you to tell people about it. Uh, and that, again, it's 87.9 on the FM dial. Uh, tonight, I want to take a look at the, the Last Supper. I want to uh, look at that story where Jesus gathers his disciples together. Because in this gathering, I think he makes some very startling comments. Uh, <clears throat> I want to read the passage. We're going to look at Matthew's version of the, the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, beginning of verse 17. It says this, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As the teacher as you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve while they were eating. And he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl will betray me. For the Son of Man must die as, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it. This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then they sang a, a, a hymn and went to the Mount of Olives. Jesus says some pretty startling things in, in this story. The first two that leap out at you is he tells his disciples, these 12 guys have been traveling around, they're friends, they spent a lot of time together, their community, that one of them was going to betray him. That had to be startling. But then he goes on and reveals that it would be Judas. And so... Very startling news, I'm sure, for those men to take that in. But I want to focus tonight on a couple other things that I think are startling. Uh, while they were eating, Jesus said, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body. <clears throat> now, in traditional Passover meals, which they had been celebrating generation after generation after generation for years and years and years, 
they would take unleavened bread and they would say, this is the bread of affliction, which our fathers ate in the wilderness. It wasn't really literally the bread of affliction, but it, it represented that. And it, it brought it vividly to mind to the Jewish people. And next, the, the person that was doing or reciting this liturgy, this Passover liturgy, would say, this the Almighty did for me when I came out of Egypt. And the worshipers in Jesus' day, they would have identified with the rescue that was being referenced through this Passover meal. Um, they would have remembered what happened long ago uh, in Egypt. Uh, it was part of what made them who they were. It, was, it formed their identity. They remembered the stories of the blood on the doorpost and the, the angel of death passing over the homes in Egypt that had the blood on the doorposts. Uh, and so this is their familiarity with the Passover. And now imagine sitting in that room and Jesus takes the bread. And now he says, this is my body. See, that was startling. And, and not only is this my body, but it's broken for you. He replaces this liturgy they have recited for years and years, generation after generation. And he basically is saying, I'm the bread. I'm the bread of life and my followers will feed on me and I'm going to be broken. See, Jesus is beginning to refer to his death. And then he does uh, something else that's startling. He takes a cup and he says, this is my blood, which has been poured out for you. Uh, Again, this points to death. Now, it's a violent death. He's going to be broken, and his blood is going to pour out. That's an incredible, startling thing. Jesus is creating a new covenant. They know about the old covenant. That's been there for generations and generations. But now Jesus is, is creating a new covenant. In the old covenant, animals were killed and their bodies broken and blood poured out. Uh, and, uh, on the altar and then sprinkled on the people and, and in order for their sins to be forgiven. In Exodus 24, we, we see Moses confirming the covenant with the people. And this is what he, this is what he says, uh, or what it says in Exodus 24, Moses drained half the blood from these animals into basins. The other half he splattered against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people. Again, they all responded, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood from the basins and splattered it all over the people, declaring, look, this blood confirms the covenant the Lord has made with you in giving you these instructions. And now Jesus says, <clears throat> I'm pouring out my blood and I'm establishing a new covenant. It's all based on my blood. Uh, animal blood can't uh, remove sin. Those sacrifices had to be done over and over and over again. But Jesus is shedding his blood once and for all. He is the perfect lamb of God. And just as Moses poured the blood of the animal out on the altar and on the people, Jesus was saying, I will pour my blood out for the people. It will be a once and for all. It's a final perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 11 to 15 says this. So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which is not made by human hands or is part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the old covenant, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who... Uh, mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the internal in, the eternal inheritance God has promised them for Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant see Jesus makes startling statements he now takes the bread and says this is my body and it's broken for you he says this cup this this wine this is my blood 
and it's going to be poured out for you. I am beginning a new covenant. I'm replacing the old one. Now, this wine and, and, and bread that we're talking about, they're not literally the body and, and blood of Christ. They're symbols representing all that Jesus did for us. They represent the new covenant. We're called to celebrate this supper together often to remember this new covenant, to remember the sacrifice Jesus made, to remember our identity. And tonight we're going to share in the Lord's Supper. Uh, we're going to together take the bread and take the cup and remember what Jesus did. After I get finished speaking and before we do that, we're going to play a song. And it's just a song to kind of get our minds focused, to reflect um, you can sing along if you would like. You can just listen. You may want to pray. You may want to confess sin and get your heart right before God. But I encourage you to just use this time as a time of reflection. I would also say that if you're not a follower of Christ and you're watching this, uh, I would say that communion, this thing that we're about to do, it's for followers of Jesus. And so I am so glad that you're here, that you're watching this, that you are observing this. But I would also say you can you don't have you shouldn't partake because it's for people that are believers. It would be kind of like putting a wedding ring on if you weren't married or you weren't getting married. Um, so this is a kind of a family thing. But you, I'm so happy you're here and observing, and, and I would encourage you to turn to Christ to to put your faith and trust in Him. It's the best, most important thing you could ever do. Um, but that that's would be my direction for you. If you're a believer here uh, and you've put your faith in Christ, um, this is a time that we can reflect, that, that we can focus. And, and if you're a believer and you don't go to our church, you, but you're a Christian, you can partake. We, we practice open communion. We, we want believers to partake, but you don't have to belong or be a member of our church. And so... Um, encourage you to do that. After the song, Paul will come and he will lead you through the taking of the elements um, and close out our time. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight and being a part of this. And uh, we look forward to Easter and uh, sharing more with you.
I could have been six feet under I could have been lost forever Yeah, I should be in that fire But now there's fire inside of me Here I am, a dead man walking No grave gonna hold God's people All the weight of all our evil Lived it away, forever free Who could believe, who could believe Forgiven, forgiven You love me even when I don't deserve this evening and I certainly miss you um, I can't wait to see you again but for now this will have to do I trust that the Lord is faithful and he will guide us through this time and sometime I'll be able to get within six feet of you um, we're gonna finish this communion service here tonight and so if you have bread or wine or juice or just some kind of element to um, partake in this with us together I would invite you to uh, get that out now and with that being said, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, um, the passage of the Last Supper. In verse 23, it says this, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. I just want to thank you again for um, joining us tonight in this service. Um, and uh, I know Easter is just a... It's going to be unique this year and very different, but that doesn't negate what Jesus did for us on the cross when he died for our sins and when he was buried and he was raised to life on the third day. And so um, in him we are victorious and in him we have a living hope. And so I just hope that none of us will forget that this weekend. Um, also on that note, I know that Joel is working really hard on an Easter sermon and uh, that'll be um, on the webpage uh, sometime on Saturday. And I know there's going to be some extra videos in it, um, some extra content. I think it's going to be really meaningful. And so uh, if you could give that a watch, I think it's just going to be um, a great time. And so I look forward to watching that with you. Hey, take it easy. Have a good night and uh, enjoy the time with whoever you're with, family or friends or just by yourself. And uh, blessings. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move.